This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 62, coming up on Space Time. New evidence supporting the supernova shockwave theory for the solar system's origins. A new window in the hunt for molecular signatures in deep space. And new clues about superluminous supernovae. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have found more evidence supporting the long-standing theory that our solar system's formation 4.6 billion years ago was triggered by a shock wave from an exploding supernova. The shock wave ejected material from the exploding star into a neighbouring molecular gas and dust cloud, causing it to collapse in on itself, in the process forming the Sun and planets, including the Earth. Now, a report in the Astrophysical Journal based on evidence of iron-60 isotopes in meteorites supports the supernova shockwave theory as the most plausible origin story for explaining our solar system. The new research by Alan Boss from the Carnegie Institute of Science offers fresh evidence supporting this theory, modelling the solar system's formation beyond the initial cloud collapse and into the intermediate stages of star formation. One very important constraint for testing theories on solar system formation involves meteorite chemistry. That's because meteorites retain a record of the elements, isotopes and compounds that existed in the solar system's earliest days. One type of meteorite, known as a carbonaceous chondrite, is especially important because they represent some of the most primitive samples. An interesting component in all meteorites, especially carbonaceous chondrites, are things known as short-lived radioactive isotopes. Isotopes are versions of elements with the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. Sometimes, as in the case of radioactive isotopes, the number of neutrons present in the nucleus of an atom can make the isotope unstable. In order to gain stability, the isotope releases energetic particles, which alters its number of protons and neutrons, in the process transmuting it into another element. Some isotopes that existed when the solar system formed are radioactive and have decay rates which cause them to become extinct within tens to hundreds of millions of years. The fact that these isotopes still existed when the chondrites formed is shown by the abundances of their stable decay products, also called daughter isotopes, which are found in some primitive chondrites. Measuring the amount of these daughter isotopes can tell scientists when and possibly how the chondrites first formed. A recent analysis of chondrites by Carnegie's Miriam Tillis was concerned with iron-60, a short-lived radioactive isotope that decays into nickel-60. It's only created in significant amounts through nuclear reactions inside asymptotic giant branch stars. These are red giants at the ends of their lives that are about to go supernova. Because all the iron-60 in the solar system's formation has long since decayed, Tillis's research focused on its daughter product, nickel-60, the amount of nickel-60 found in meteorite samples, especially in comparison with the amount of stable ordinary iron-56, can indicate how much iron-60 was present when the larger parent body asteroid from which the meteorite broke off was formed. The important point is there aren't many options for how an excess of iron-60, which later decayed into nickel-60, could have gotten into a primitive solar system object in the first place. But one of the options which is available is a supernova. While her research didn't find a smoking gun, which definitively proves that the radioactive isotopes were injected by a shockwave, Tillis's work does show that the amount of iron-60 present in the early solar system is consistent with a supernova origin. Taking this latest meteorite research into account, Boss revisited his earlier models of shockwave-triggered cloud collapse, extending his computation models beyond the initial collapse and into the intermediate stages of star formation, a time when the Sun was first being created. An important next step in tying together solar system origin modelling and meteorite sample analysis. Boss says his new findings indicate that a supernova shockwave is still the most plausible origin story for explaining the short-lived radioactive isotopes in our solar system. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have begun using one of the precursor radio telescopes for the Square Kilometre Array project to study molecular signatures which could eventually lead to the detection of complex molecules that are the precursors to life. 
The team are using the Murchison Wide Field Array Radio Telescope to undertake observations focusing on the molecular gas and dust clouds from which new generations of stars are born. The findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society and on the pre-press physics website archive.org, represent the widest field of view molecular survey of the Milky Way ever published. They also represent the first ever detection of molecules in the 70 to 300 megahertz frequency range of the Murchison Observatory. The team successfully detected two molecules, sulfonyl and nitric oxide, towards the galactic centre. Sulfonyl, also known as the Macapto radical, is a simple free radical molecule consisting of one hydrogen and one sulfur atom. Free radicals are molecules with bonding structures that include an unpaired electron, which makes them highly chemically reactive. Sulfonyl appears in the metabolism of living organisms as H2S, and is one of the top three sulfur-containing gases in giant gas planets such as Jupiter. It's also suspected of being found in low-mass spectral-type M-red dwarf stars and in failed stars known as brown dwarves. Prior to this discovery, the Macapto radical had only ever been seen twice before at infrared wavelengths in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. The study shows that sulfonyl molecules are emitting photons detectable around 100 MHz, which can be observed by the Murchison array. The other molecule detected was nitric oxide, it's also a free radical, this time comprising nitrogen and oxygen. In mammals, including humans, nitric oxide is an important cellular signaling molecule involved in numerous physiological and pathological processes. The study's lead author, Shinoa Tremblay, from the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research and Curtin University, says the molecular transition seen by her team all came from slow variable stars at the ends of their lives that are becoming unstable. Astronomers can therefore use these molecules to probe the Milky Way to better understand the chemical and physical environments of stars as well as gas and dust clouds. Since the 1980s, frequencies greater than 80 GHz have usually been used for this type of work due to the freedom from radio frequency interference emitted by cell phones, televisions and orbiting satellites. But the extreme radio quietness of the Murchison Radio Astronomy's location in outback Western Australia allows astronomers to study molecular signatures from stars and star-forming regions at far lower frequencies than ever before. The multi-billion dollar Square Kilometre Array project is building the world's largest radio telescope comprising thousands of antennas across Australia and South Africa. Following on from this pilot study, a new survey of the Orion Nebula is now in progress, using the Murchison Array in a low frequency range of 99 to 270 MHz. At a distance of 1,344 light years, the chemical rich environment of the Orion Nebula, or Messier 42, is the nearest large star forming region to Earth. The diffuse nebula is located south of Orion's belt, and it's visible to the unaided eye as the fuzzy middle star in the Sword of Orion. M42 is estimated to be about 24 light years across and has a mass about 2,000 times that of the Sun. The aim of this new study is to detect more chemical traces in stars and compare these regions to the observations of the galactic centre pilot region, allowing astronomers to better understand the emission mechanisms for these molecules. This new technique therefore will pave the way for deeper surveys, ones that can probe both the Milky Way and other galaxies in search of molecular precursors to life. Tremblay says her team are now also hoping to discover signatures from long-chain amino acids in the cold gas environments being observed, which is where they're most likely to be stable. I'm using the Murchison Wide Field Array to study the chemistry within our own galaxy. In a lot of the other telescopes that we're using to study the chemistry, we're looking at uh, molecules in different environments, usually in warm gas. By using something like the Murchison Wide Field Array, I can start to study molecules in colder gas where they might be more stable, so we might be able to see larger molecules. And of course, colder gas is what we look at when we want to look into stellar nurseries where new stars could be born eventually. Yes. Also, around stars that have already been born um, have a cold gas in front of them where new molecules are also being formed or also planets are starting to be formed. And so trying to understand how did the complicated molecules we see on Earth get onto our planet. And there are two specific molecules you've been looking at. Uh, one's nitric oxide, the other's a uh, radical. Yes, the 
both of these molecules, the nitric oxide has been detected in space previously, and so has the mercaptor radical, but this is the first time we've seen the mercaptor radical at radio wavelengths in comparison to infrared wavelengths. And both of these are rarely found in stars, and we found them in more stars, which is particularly interesting because we don't know why we couldn't see them before. Why are these two specific molecules so interesting, other than the fact you're looking at them in radio wavelengths for the first time? Um, nitric oxide is particularly interesting because it has been found to be an important thing for finding larger biomolecules. So if we're looking for signs of life at other places, nitric oxide is a very simple molecule, and so it should be easier to find, but give us traces and ideas of where to start looking for more complicated molecules that are more directly related to life. But also itself, nitric oxide is important to our own biomechanical systems because it is important to our own cardiovascular health as well. The mercaptor radical has been interesting because one of the big mysteries, I suppose, is that we can't find sulfur tied to molecules in gas, um, or it's been very really rarely found. And so trying to identify why we can't seem to find it. So sulfur itself, we can find it as an element all over the place. But we haven't been able to find sulfur as a molecule very often, and we don't know why. So we're hoping to be able to look at it in colder environments where it might be more stable and see where it might be hiding and to make it easier to find it with other telescopes. When you use the Murchison Wildfield Array, what makes it so good is that it's doing a really great job of looking at these specific wavelengths. So it's looking at 70 to 300 megahertz, which is what makes it unique. A lot of the previous telescopes, for especially for studying chemistry, has been at these high gigahertz frequencies. So by looking at the lower frequencies, but Murchison Widefield Array also has another particular characteristic that makes it interesting in this that it can see a very large area of the sky. So one of the benefits of the survey that I've been doing in studying the chemistry is that I can look at a very large area of the sky all at once, which would take other telescopes hundreds or thousands of observations and hours in order to be able to see the same patch of sky. And to give an idea of the size of that area is if you look at the size of our moon, the patch of sky that I've recently done the survey on would take up 1,500 or more than 1,500 moons to cover the same amount of area. So it's quite a benefit in that way. With radio telescopes, you guys who are doing radio research, you're looking at a whole range of different frequencies, each of which requires a different type of telescope. Is that right? Is that how that works? Yeah, well, to a certain amount. Everything in the sky are really big or bright radio emitters. And so that means that as we go into the really low frequencies or the very long wavelengths of the wide field array, is that no longer do we have to have these big, huge, movable dishes on the sky. Instead, we can start having these what's called dipole antennas. They look like bow ties or little spiders of bits of metal that are on the ground. So it makes the setup of the telescope a bit simpler, but it changes the characteristics of what we can see on the sky and what we're studying in the sky. That's what gives us the benefit of being able to see so much of the area as well. By using specific types of telescopes of specific designs, that lets you see a specific range of frequencies. Yeah, it, it does. It has a lot to do with the electronics as well, but the different shapes and different sh sizes of the telescopes allow you to see different amounts of the sky and also be able to view at different wavelengths. With something the style of the Murchison Wide Field Array with the dipoles, you wouldn't be able to view at higher frequencies because you would have other effects. Whereas if you have big dish antennas, it makes it harder to see at lower frequencies, but it's not impossible. It's reversible in one way, but not in the other. So the dipoles can't see at higher frequencies, but dishes can see at lower frequencies. What sort of other things are you guys going to be looking at? The Murchison Wide Field Array has a wide range of science goals. 
In particular, it studies pulsars. It's looking for these fast radio bursts, or FRBs, which are fast pulses in the sky, which we don't know exactly the origin of them at this point. It's looking for the epoch of reionization, so the early universe when stars first turned on. And it's studying galaxies. They've also recently done a very large survey of the sky called Gleam, which is an imaging survey, which you could download the cell phone app onto your phone and you could see what, what our telescope sees of the sky and what you would see if you could see in the radio. And this is all as a precursor to the Square Kilometre Array project. Yes, it is. So this is the Murchison Widefield Array is located on the site of where the low frequency version of the Square Kilometre Array is. So it's a test bed for the environment away from the interference created by humans in our use of cell phones and TV and things like that, as well as the technology that will be built into a much larger project like the SK. You were talking earlier about how you uh, were able to identify nitric oxide oxide and the capto radicals. How ubiquitous are you finding these to be in cold molecular clouds? Are they pretty well everywhere you look when you look in cold molecular clouds with Murchison or, or have they been restricted to only specific areas or is it too early to tell? I think it's a little bit too early to tell at this stage. The survey that I've recently done was the first one of its kind. And so I decided to take the approach of doing a shallow survey is what it's called. So just a short time on the sky, a really big area, and just see what we see. And that will help build the criteria for future surveys. And by doing that, I was only sensitive to very unique environment. So we found these molecules, both the nitric oxide and the mercaptor radical, around evolved stars, so stars that are quite late on in their age of life. And these environments mean that they, they have to be very special in order for us to be able to find them. So we don't know exactly how often we're going to find them yet, but the fact that we can start finding them gives us information as to how to build these surveys in the future and detect a lot more of them. And you said you found these around evolved stars. We're talking about uh, stars off the main sequence already when you say evolved? Yeah, they're following along the main sequence but getting on close to the end of their life and so it will start branching off at this point as to what they do. These are also old enough that they tend to, their environments are quite variable and so they create these bits of shock that are these waves that are kind of going through the gas, which is creating the energy for us to be able to detect these molecules. So what, wolf ray stars or just M-class flares, things like that? Yes, closer to M-class um, flares. These stars are close to the galactic center, and nothing has really been identified about these stars except for their presence. One of the things about large wide field surveys is that we'll be able to go and pinpoint unique areas to go and look with higher sensitivity sensitivity telescopes to tell us more about what's going on in these environments. Have you had the chance to look at things closer to home, Barnard Star, that might be a bit too far north, I don't know, but uh, Proxima Centauri, things like that? So right now I'm working on designing and doing a survey of Orion. So in the Orion constellation around the sword is a cloud of gas or a birth of a place of birth of stars is happening. And this is the Orion in that region... Yeah, the Orion Nebula. Yeah, the biggest yeah, nearest absolutely. star forming region to us. Yeah. Yes. And so it's been a really popular test bed for understanding the chemistry and the modeling and the physics and things like that. So that's the next region that I'm looking at now to see what we can correlate some of that information with frequent other surveys that have been done at other frequencies, as well as learning some new things about the environment. That's you know a Tremblay from the International Center of Radio Astronomy Research and Curtin University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary.
Astronomers have detected the nearest ever superluminous supernova. The supernova discovery challenges current ideas about how and where such supercharged supernovas can occur. When massive stars far larger than the Sun run out of fuel, they collapse in on themselves, creating a spectacular explosion known as a core collapse or Type II supernova, an event powerful enough to briefly outshine an entire galaxy. Of the many thousands of supernovae observed over the past decade, astronomers have detected about 50 which were especially powerful, up to 100 times brighter than other core collapse supernovae. Astronomers refer to these as superluminous supernovae. And one of these superluminous supernovae, known as SN2017 EGM, is now offered new clues about their formation. The supernova was first detected on May 23, 2017, in a spiral galaxy about 430 million light years away. And that's about three times closer than any other superluminous supernova ever detected. So astronomers used this relatively nearby discovery to examine the event in detail. A report in the Astrophysical Journal Letters found that supernova SN2017 EGM occurred in a highly metallistic galaxy, meaning a galaxy with a high concentration of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. You see, astronomers refer to all elements other than hydrogen and helium as metals. The finding's important because it's the first clear evidence of a metal-rich birthplace for a superluminous supernova. Previously, all superluminous supernovae were found in small dwarf galaxies, which were known to have low metal content, and were consequently thought to be an essential prerequisite ingredient for making these types of supernovae explosions. This study also supports the idea that a rapidly spinning highly magnetised neutron star, known as a magnetar, is the likely engine driving the incredible amount of light being generated by these supernovae. While the brightness of SN2017 EGM and the properties of the magnetar that powers it overlaps with those of other superluminous supernovae, the amount of mass ejected by SN2017 EGM may be lower than the average event. This difference may indicate that the massive star that led to SN2017 EGM lost more mass than most superluminous supernova progenitors before exploding. The spin rate of the magnetar may also be slower than average. These results show that the amount of metals has at most only a small effect on the properties of a superluminous supernova and the engine driving it. However, the metal-rich variety occurs at only about 10% the rate of the metal-poor ones. Similar results have been found for bursts of gamma rays associated with the explosions of massive stars, and this suggests a close association between these two types of objects. From July the 4th this year through to September the 16th, SN2017 EGN won't be visible because its line of sight is too close to the Sun. However, after that, detailed studies should be possible for at least a few more years, which itself should break all the records for how long a superluminous supernova can be observed. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. An Ariane Space Vega rocket has successfully launched two satellites into orbit. The mission blasted off into ink-black late-night skies from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. À tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Animal P80, décollage. What an amazing sight. Vega blazing a trail across the night skies here above the Guiana Space Center heading out north and we can hear the rumble coming across here now at the Space Center. We broke the sound barrier 31 seconds. 31 seconds after launch, when we reached Mach 1. He's telling us that everything's going normally. We're burning the P-80, the first stage. 
And it has burnt all its propellant. We don't need any any more. It falls away. And we are shedding weight. The lighter we are, the faster we go. And we're now burning the Z23. It's the second stage. It burns for about one minute and 40. And Z stands for Zephyro, which is an Italian type of wind. 23 La trajectoire est nominale. Because it burns 23 tons of solid propellant. Our altitude, we're 100 kilometers above sea level. And that means that we are now basically going into space. We've reached what's called the Kármán line, the border between our atmosphere and outer space, the point where the atmosphere becomes so thin that it can no longer support aeroplanes with wings. And so the pilotage we have to use rocketry. To stay up it was named after the Hungarian American aerospace engineer Theodore von Karman, often known as the father of supersonic flight. Tous les paramètres bord sont nominaux. He was born in 1881 and died in the 1960s, and he was a director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Separation du Zephyro 23. Okay, we have now lost the Z23 and we are waiting for the next stage to switch on. That's called the Z9. Here we go, the scheduled moment for the ignition of that engine. And then we'll shortly get the separation of the fairing. There it goes. So we don't need the fairing anymore because we are very outside the uh, atmosphere now, which is very thin, so there's no friction. Aboard Ariane Space Flight VV-10 were two Earth observation satellites housed in a new lighter protective fairing for the launch. The primary payload, Italy's new Optsat 3000, was released 42 minutes after launch. The 368 kilogram spacecraft will provide Italy's Ministry for Defence with global high-resolution images of the planet's surface for the next seven years. The 264 kilogram joint Franco-Israeli Venus satellite was released 49 minutes later. Venus is a new generation of vegetation and environment monitoring microsatellite developed by Israel. It'll study changes in vegetation and the environment and also test a new electrical propulsion system. Venus will have an expected operational lifespan of about four and a half years. The mission also saw the first trial of Vega's new lighter payload fairing. These fairings are designed to protect satellites from damage by Earth's atmosphere during their ascent phase into space. The fairings are then jettisoned at altitudes over 100 kilometers, the official start of space, where the atmosphere becomes far too thin and rarefied to affect the spacecraft. The new payload fairing was developed under the European Space Agency's Launches Exploitation Accompaniment Program and manufactured by RUAG Space in Switzerland with Italy's EVL as prime contractor. The technology was first used on the last Ariane 5 flight, which launched on June 28. The new fairing structure features fewer panels and no metallic joints. The use of different composite materials and improved manufacturing techniques have also lowered production costs. Meanwhile, a launch pad modification for this flight also reduced acoustic loads. That's the pressure caused by sound waves on the payloads at liftoff from the first stage plumes striking the structure. The new changes exploited a computer model of the acoustic environment at liftoff, which is developed under a joint ESA-NASA knowledge exchange agreement for launches. Flight and ground measurements of the launch will help engineers determine how well the new fairings and acoustic improvements have worked. The total mass for the launch was 982 kilograms. The satellites totaled 672 kilograms, with the payload adapters and carrying structures making up the rest. The flight was also the second launch of a Vega rocket this year. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Fresh sanctions have been placed on both North Korea and Iran after the two rogue nations carried out missile tests over the past few weeks. Most of the attention is focused on North Korea, which has carried out numerous missile tests in recent months, including two flights involving intercontinental ballistic missiles, one of which narrowly missed a commercial airliner in the skies over the Sea of Japan. In fact, last week's launch of an ICBM by Pyongyang proved many so-called missile and warfare experts wrong, by confirming North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un now has the capability of reaching the continental United States. The missile flew for around 45 minutes, about five minutes longer than the ICBM North Korea launched on July 4th. The missile flew on a very high trajectory, 
reaching an altitude of 3,700 kilometres, a technique known as high lofting. It effectively limited the missile's range to just 1,000 kilometres, splashing down just west of the Japanese island of Hokkaido. Now, if the missile's altitude and flight times are correct, it means it has a range of around 10,400 kilometres, placing Los Angeles, San Francisco and pretty well all points west of Chicago well within range of Pyongyang, depending on the size of the warhead payload. Both this missile and the one fired on July the 4th are known as the KN-08, they're also known as the Rodong C and the Wasong-14. The ICBM flown on July the 4th was also launched at a very steep angle, reaching an altitude of about 2,500 kilometres before splashing down some 930 kilometres away, giving it a theoretical range which includes Alaska and Hawaii. The Wasong-14 is a two-stage ICBM using Chinese WS-51-200 missile technology. Both are based on the Russian Topol three-stage ICBM, which is equipped with a single 800 kiloton thermonuclear warhead that has been experimentally fitted with MIRVs. Incidentally, North Korea has six of those huge 16-wheeled mobile transporters used to move and launch the Wasong-14 ICBMs. They were sold to Pyongyang by China, supposedly for use as lumber transporters. Beijing clearly has a lot to answer for. As for the other member of the so-called axis of evil Iran... Well, it's also continued with its own missile program, with a launch on July 27th in breach of United Nations Security Council Resolution 2231. That launch was part of Tehran's ongoing program to develop a long-range weapons delivery capability. There are growing fears among Tehran's Middle Eastern neighbours that Iran is continuing with its secretive nuclear weapons program despite the much-criticised deal it signed with the Obama administration in 2015. The oil-rich nation is continuing to claim its nuclear program is for peaceful power generation only. However, Tehran's been unable to explain why it's been enriching its uranium stockpiles well beyond the 4% needed for nuclear fuel rods. The use of hundreds of centrifuges in the enriching program points to a deliberate campaign to develop weapons-grade uranium with 90% uranium-235. There are now growing concerns Iran will continue to follow the lead of Pyongyang, which secretly developed nuclear weapons and is now in the process of miniaturising them to fit onto their missile warheads. The simple fact is, Iran and North Korea have been sharing missile and nuclear technology for decades. Iran's July 27th launch involved Tehran's Simgor or Phoenix missile, which is derived from the Safiya-2 or Ambassador missile, a 25-metre-long two-stage ICBM. The first stage uses four Safir non-gimbaled or fixed rocket engines as well as four smaller Werner rockets for steering. It's almost a carbon copy of North Korea's Taepodang-2 missile, using a combination of kerosene and inhibited red-fuming nitric acid oxidizer as propellants. The upper stage is also based on the Safar. In 2009, Tehran tried to legitimise its missile development program by replacing the usual explosive warhead on the Safar with an experimental satellite, the OMID, it then launched the missile into an orbital rather than ballistic trajectory, placing the spacecraft into a 245-kilometre high low-Earth orbit. The Safar-2 is based on Iran Shahab-3 or Meteor medium-range ballistic missile, which has a range of 2,000 kilometres. It was developed by Tehran with help from Pyongyang and is based on North Korea's single-stage Nodong-1 medium-range ballistic missile, which itself is a carbon copy of a Russian missile better known in the West as the Scud. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Warming of the planet by 2 degrees Celsius is often seen as a tipping point which people should try to avoid by limiting man-made greenhouse gas emissions. However, new research by the University of Washington has found that greenhouse gas emissions are so bad that the Earth will almost certainly exceed that 2 degree figure anyway. The new study shows there's only a 5% chance that the Earth will warm by 2 degrees or less by the end of the century. And there's only a mere 1% chance that the warming could be kept at or below 1.5 degrees, the target set by the 2016 Paris Agreement. The analysis shows that the goal of 2 degrees is very much a best-case scenario. The study's authors say it is achievable, but only with major sustained efforts on all fronts over the next 80 years. 
The new statistically based projections reported in Nature Climate Change show a 90% chance that temperatures will increase this century by between 2 and 4.9 degrees Celsius. The most recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change included future warming rates based on four scenarios for future carbon emissions. These scenarios range from business as usual emissions from growing economies like India and China to serious worldwide efforts to transition away from fossil fuels. Using statistical projections for each of these quantities based on 50 years of past data from countries around the world, the study finds a medium value of 3.2 degrees Celsius warming by 2100 and a 90% chance that warming this century will actually fall between 2 and 4.9 degrees Celsius. A new study claims drinking alcohol improves memory for information learned before the drinking episode began. The findings, published in Nature Scientific Reports, examined 88 social drinkers who were given a word-learning task. Participants were then split into two groups at random and told to either drink as much as they liked, the average being four drinks, or not to drink at all. The next day, they all did the same task again, and amazingly, those who were drunk alcohol remembered much more of what they had learned. The research not only showed that those who drank alcohol did better when repeating a word-learning task, but that the effect was stronger among those who drank more. Scientists admit they still don't fully understand what causes this effect, but the leading explanation is that alcohol blocks the learning of new information, and therefore the brain has more resources available to lay down other recently learned information into long-term memory. A new expedition led by the Australian National University will help solve the mysteries of Zealandia, an underwater continent to the east of Australia in the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is a hot spot for volcanoes and earthquake activity. The drill ship Joides Resolution is undertaking the two-month expedition as part of an international ocean discovery program. The expedition will take drill core samples to help scientists better understand the major changes in the global tectonic configuration that started about 53 million years ago as the Ring of Fire came into existence. Sealandia, including today's Lord Howe Rise, was largely part of Australia until about 75 million years ago, when it started to break away and move to the northeast. That movement halted about 53 million years ago. Zealandia covers about 5 million square kilometres and extends from south of New Zealand northwards to New Caledonia and west to the Ken Plateau off the Australian city of Rockhampton. Continental crust of Zealandia was thin by stretching before it separated from Australia, so that it now lies lower than Australia, but it's still thicker than the surrounding oceanic crust, so it lies higher than that. As Australia moved north and the Tasman Sea developed, global circulation patterns changed and water depths over Zealandia fluctuated. Scientists at Penn State University are hopeful that a compound they tested on both mice and on human cells in a petri dish takes a positive step to creating a new drug which can kill melanoma cancer cells without harming nearby healthy tissue. In a series of studies, researchers designed and synthesized the compound called NISC6 to inhibit both the AKT1 pathway and human topo-2-alpha activity, which contribute to melanoma tumor growth. Melanoma, which is caused primarily by exposure to the sun's ultraviolet rays, causes more than 75% of skin cancer deaths. In the study, reported in the European Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, the compound caused human melanoma cells to die and inhibited tumor growth by about 69%. It's an important development because recent attempts to use drugs to treat melanoma are not completely effective. Problem is, many current treatments have unsatisfactory response rates. One drug, PLX4032, works well initially. The problem is, the tumours then develop resistance within about six to seven months. So the researchers combined a few different approaches to their earlier work to develop the new compound. While scientists are still in the process of studying the actual mechanism behind how the drug works, the compound appears to target a process that guides cell division and growth. When a cell divides and grows, the DNA inside it becomes tangled. To resolve the problem, humans have a protein called toposomerase, which cuts the DNA and joins it back to release the stress. This compound may be able to inhibit the activity of the topo-2-alpha protein, leaving the DNA unable to unwind itself. NISC6 may also work on other forms of cancer, which will likely be included in future research. And finally for now, a new study of feline DNA shows that cats domesticated themselves, and in true feline fashion, they took their time in deciding whether or not to adopt humans as pets. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Ecology and Evolution, are based on a study of DNA from more than 200 cats spanning more than 9,000 years. 
as well as modern family pets, the samples also included DNA from ancient Romanian cats, mummified Egyptian cats and modern African wildcats. The DNA analysis suggests that cats lived for thousands of years alongside humans before they decided to become domesticated. And it seems during this time, their DNA changed little from those of their African wildcat ancestors. The only significant difference being the picking up of the distinctive stripes and dots of the tabby cat, a trait which apparently arrived fairly recently. It seems about 8,000 years ago, cats began hanging around farming communities in the Fertile Crescent, where they developed a mutually beneficial relationship with humans by hunting rodents, thereby taking care of the mice and rats that were attracted to the crops and grains produced by early human civilizations. Scientists speculate the cats likely followed the rodents into human settlements, and people likely allowed the cats to remain because they were doing such a good job of controlling rodent populations. Humans then probably began feeding the cats to keep them around. The early ancestors of today's cats spread from Southwest Asia into Europe some 6,400 years ago. About 3,500 years ago, a second cat lineage, comprising African cats which dominated Egypt at the time, also spread across the Mediterranean and into Europe. The tabby cat markings first began to appear in domesticated cats during the Middle Ages. The gene originating from Southwest Asia and later becoming common across Europe and Africa. Unlike cats, whose powder affection meant they didn't need any changes, dogs, which were domesticated much earlier, up to 20,000 years ago, were selected to perform specific tasks, which has resulted into the diversification into the many breeds we see today. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at spacetimewithstuartgary on Instagram... And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.